note. Well, we're doing the Book of Micah, and um, I know that's an. It seems like an odd book. It's not a book that most people do. You probably don't ever go into that book. Um, but um, I just felt the Lord put on my heart that we needed to do Micah, and I think it's really for such a time as this. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and just get into it. Uh, we're in chapter one. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Mor Morasheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all you peoples, listen to the earth, all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness to you, the Lord of his holy temple. Behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the tr transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field, place places for planting a vineyard. I will pour down her stones into the valley and I will come cover the, her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces and all her pay as a harlot shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate for she gathered it from the pe from the pay of the harlot and they shall return to the pay of the harlot. Therefore, I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make wailing like the jackals and the mourning like ostriches. For her wounds are incurable. For it has come to Judah. It has come to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all in beth -Hirath. Roll yourself in the dust. Pass by in naked shame, you inhabitant of Shafir. The inhabitant of Zan does not go out. Beth Ezel mourns, its place to stand is taken away from you. For the inhabitant of Meroth pined for good, but disaster came down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. O oh, inhabitant of Lachish, harness the, sh the chariot to the swift steeds. She was beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for the transgression of Israel were found in you. Therefore, you shall give presents of Morsheth Goth. The houses of Ashub shall be lie to the king of Israel. I will yet bring an heir to you, O inhabitant of Merishah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourself bald and cut off your hair because your precious children enlarge your baldness like an eagle for they shall go from you into captivity. So looking at Micah, um, we see that Micah, he's one of the minor prophets and um, uh, he's Micah of Morsheth. And that was about 20 five miles southwest of Jerusalem between the borders of Judah and Philist the Philistines. Micah was the minor prophet from the country sent to the city to bring the word of the Lord. And this was um, sometime between 739 BC, which was the start of the reign of Jotham, and 686 BC to the end of the reign of Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was a reformer, and this was in the day and age where they didn't have any good kings. Um, there were a lot of very evil kings, but Hezekiah was a reformer, and that means that he, what he did is he reigned for 25, he reigned at the age of 25 for 29 years, and during that time of reign, he turned towards God and made some changes. Um, and if you look at 2 Kings 18, 3 through 6, it states, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. This is talking about Hezekiah. According to all that his father David had done, he removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images and broken pieces, the bronze serpent that Moses has made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. So Micah is mainly confronting concerns um, the time before the reforms of Hezekiah. So, um, God had put on his heart that he needed to share this. Now, obviously, we're talking about Israelites. 
and the Israelites, obviously God's chosen people. Now, the city of Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. And Micah looks to both the northern and the southern kingdoms in his prophecy. And at this time, King Ahaz was an evil ruler. So as we know, the children, God had taken them through so much. They had been through their 400 years of bondage and slavery to Egypt. He takes them through, you know, all of the things that he actually just shows his way, takes them and brings them into freedom, brings them into the promised land and continues to work with them. And they continue to allow idolatry to come in, in one form or another. And so um, when, these, when these kings would come in and they would set these high places, they would bring the idolatrous ways in. And it's very easy to allow um, ourselves to be tainted by those things because it's, it's kind of like a frog in a pot of boiling water. You know, you first put them in the pot and it's warm and they don't, and, and next thing you know, they're cooked. They don't even realize it because it's such a slow transition. And so this is where they had become. They had gotten to this point of, um, you know, the religious um, ceremonies and stuff that they did. It was a business. They just did it because they were supposed to do it. It was not this heart after God. They had idols. And um, so now God has sent Micah to give them this prophecy. And Micah sees the Lord descending from the heaven to the earth to judge. And uh, Micah is very uh, flavorful in his terms and what he says, because to him, he's very passionate about it. This, he's putting out word pictures and he does a vivid word picture of the mountains melting and the valleys disappearing. This is the power of God coming from heaven to earth. And with his presence there, everything, as we know, the Bible says, everything will bow before him. And so he is, he is using this vivid word picture of the mountains melting and the valleys disappearing um, because he's comparing those, two, those things to sinful man. Sinful man cannot stand against God and that they, they have no chance against the Lord's judgment. And God's disdain for sin brings about this powerful descent from heaven. So um, basically, it's kind of like, you know, um, when daddy comes home and now we're having to pay the toll of the piper because of the things that, that they have done. So these people of Judah and Israel were generally God-fearing. Um, but to a point, you know, they, they had lost that fervor, that zeal for the Lord. And even though they were the chosen people, and the thing is, is that is, I'm sure that what they were comparing themselves to were the, were the other countries and the other cities outside of them, looking at them as pagans. They have always sneered their nose at them because they're the chosen people. And I'm sure they were comparing themselves. Well, we're not like them. And how many times do we do that in our life that we, we place the wrong kind of comparison there? And um, the comparison that they should have had would be comparing themselves to God. That is our mark. Anytime we miss the mark, we're missing a comparison to Jesus Christ. So we're not to compare ourselves with other people and go, oh, I'm not so bad. You know, I could, you know, at least I'm not doing this. At least I'm not doing that. But the fact of the matter is, because they were the children of God, God was not going to tolerate their misbehaving. He was not going to tolerate their idolatry. And, you know, I know if you ever had kids and those kids come to you and go, well, so-and-so's parents don't care. You say, well, I'm not their parent. And it's kind of that whole thing that God is not going to tolerate this from his people. Um, and so this is why they are receiving um, God's judgment. And the thing that we need to pay attention to is at this point in time, because they were having other comparisons, they were slowly allowing this stuff to infiltrate their lives. We can very easily do the same thing and we can very easily be deceived. And um, if we look at 1 Peter 4.17, okay. for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. We are God's children, and God Join is the going meeting. to deal with us differently than he's going to deal with the world in certain circumstances. Yes, the ultimate judgment is if you don't know Jesus Christ, 
then you're not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. But there's other things going on in our lives. And we may look at people outside of the faith and we may say, well, how come they can get away with that? And I can't get away with that because God is not going to have his house destroyed by our undoing. He is not going to allow us to continue to get away with things and set bad examples for other people and set a bad example for him. And because we're here to glorify him. And so it begins first with us. And um, to finish off first Peter uh, 4, 17, it says, and it first begins with us. What shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? So we are called to a place of obedience just as they were called to a place of obedience. And Micah prophesied the coming judgment of Samaria. Now, Samaria had allowed a lot of worldly things to come in. It was the capital city of Israel. So obviously it was hustling and bustling and different people were coming through that had different beliefs and different things. And money was coming through there. And all kinds of, that's why he deals with, he says, you know, about a harlot because we can sell ourselves out for certain things and not even realize that that's what we're doing, but that's what they had done. And so um, that being the capital city of Israel, it was busy, it was full of all different types of people coming through and all different thoughts and processes of things and um, different types of, of religions as well and idols and so forth. So this prophecy actually came true 722 BC when Samaria fell to the Assyrians and was completely destroyed. So God says, I'm not going to have this. And so he dealt with them. And as um, we spoke about in 2 Kings 18, 3 through 6, Hezekiah broke down the high places and he broke down sacred pillars. And so this is all about idolatry. And Micah in this portion of scripture is prophesying about Samaria and their idolatry, which is likened to spiritual idolatry. We can all do that. Um, uh, idolatry never, pray, never pays. The tendency is, is to follow things. And we, we follow people. We um, follow the dollar. You know, we're willing to compromise our beliefs for certain things that we want to achieve. For um, maybe perhaps for certain friends that we have. For um, wanting to feel good about ourselves. Whatever it is, we can set these idols up. And the question is is what are we going to do about it? Are we going to allow the Holy Spirit to get in and, and, and deal with us and re reveal things to our hearts? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to take that before the Lord? And so it, Micah, um, he talks about Samaria's um, idolatry, their spiritual idolatry, and that um, we very subtly have idols. They had idols, graven images, so forth like that. But our tendency is we have these little idols, things that we, we hold back, things that, you know, maybe no one sees what our idol is. You know, um, we, we put people on pedestals and, and sometimes, you know, we're, we're trying to emulate them rather than emulate God. And so um, they are still idols, though, and we need to allow the, the spirit to deal with those with us. In Exodus 20, 3 through 5, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. Thou shalt not bow, thy, bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am jealous and a jealous God. This visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So anything that we put above God, even if it's, um, you know, our time, we put our time above God, um, you know, that can, that can become an idol. And so God does, God will tear down those idols. He will not have any part of them. And because he loves us, he doesn't want us to have any part of them. And then um, Micah goes into this, that he's going to be wailing and that he's, he's going to be all these, he's very graphic about all of this. And basically judgment is hard. Although Micah was sent to prophesy to these people, he was very passionate about it and, and he felt for them. He wept for them. It was hard for him. And, and doing what God calls us to do is oftentimes not pleasant. 
you know it's sometimes it's that uncomfortableness of having to go to somebody and and really tell them the truth you know well they may not like me if i tell them the truth and they may make them sad if i tell them the truth if i point these things out to them and i'm talking about the truth of god's word in their life i'm not talking necessarily about boy that makes you look fat now, if they want you to do that, that's a whole other thing. But we have to say, always oh, say the truth in love. And it cannot be a truth in judgment. It needs to be a truth in love. So even if it's how they are dealing with things, maybe, you know what? I think you're putting this above God and you really need to pray about that. We do it because we love them, not because we want to just pick them apart and be critical. But here, Micah was told by God to do this. And so he put God above his feelings for these people. These were his people. And it saddened him to have to do this. And, but he couldn't see any way around it. And then he talks about that, that they're incurable. Well, we are not incurable. God can do anything in our lives. And God requires and welcomes repentance. And all we have to do is bring our sin to him. So with God, we are curable. All of our wounds are curable. All of our hurts, all of our pains, all of our sin is curable. And we're, we never, sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll hear somebody go, oh, it's too late for me. I've already gone too far. It's never too late. Uh, Luke 18, 27, and he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So it's never too late. God wants us to come to him with all of our struggles, all of our problems, all of our passions, all of our, um, all of our sins, you know, we can't hide them from him. So why do we even try? Why do we even go for and ask something, of, you know, somebody to fix something for us or something to fix something for us when we haven't taken it before God? He's the, ultimately the only one who can do that. And so we need to be willing to take it before God. And we need to be willing to open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit and to God's word, which is that two-edged sword that um, can cut through us like nothing else can and show us any areas that we have sin and any things that we need to bring to God and hand over to him. We have absolutely no reason to ever say, I didn't know. We can always find out. And, and then he goes on in verses 10 through 16. He talks about um, uh, lots of different cities and their demise. Um, the city of Gath belonged to the Philistines. And he talks about how it hurt to think that the Philistines, if, if Gath was told what was going to happen, then they would rejoice in the pain of God's people. And that saddened him. But sometimes things have to happen in order for something new to happen. And so sometimes we feel like, you know, God's breaking us. We're in a time right now where a lot of people are, are feeling like, God, why are you allowing this to happen? It's a breaking of ground. Sometimes our ground gets fallow and God says, let's shake it up a little bit and get some new growth going. And he wants to do a new thing in us. And he was going to do a new thing with them. There was a remnant. The Israelites aren't gone. They, they multiplied and multiplied and multiplied, and he knew exactly what was needed to make that happen. And it's taking out and, and separating that chafe from the wheat. And so Micah talks about several of these different cities and their demise. They say that he's making little plays on words because of the Hebrew language. Um, and um, But then he talks about that they... Um, that they should shave their heads and, and ashes and rolling in the dirt, that kind of a thing. Well, when someone would die in the Jew Jewish culture, they would have to, sh they would shave their heads, they would rip their clothes, they would cover themselves with ashes. And um, this is where subtle, unrepented sin will take us a death. We become captives of our enemy. He talks about your children. You're going to rip your clothes. You're going to shave your head because your children will become captives. And that's what sin does, is it makes us captive. And we will become captives of our enemy, which, which Satan wants to come and kill and destroy. And so we don't want to be caught in that bondage. 
We don't want to be that point where there's just such a death. We want to always allow the Holy Spirit to work life in us. And, and remember that sin brings us to bondage. And so therefore, even if we're not noticing it, we, that's that iron sharpens iron, being around other Christian sisters and so forth and allowing them to point things out, allowing the Holy Spirit to point things out, inviting that so that we don't have to get to that point of total and utter death in the aspect of, you know, being down in the pits. But God will, he's faithful. He will always bring us out of it. And there will always be a remnant that he can start new with. So why don't we go ahead and um, go to questions? <laughs>